Round Trip by John Brunner Originally published in the July 1959 issue of New World's Science Fiction Magazine and republished in September of the same year in Fantastic Universe Magazine, it next appeared in a collection of the author's stories entitled Out of My Mind in 1967, then another called Not Before Time in 1968. Out of My Mind was rebound and reissued in 1980. Read by Daryl T. Smith II for my channel, Quasar Spectra. A brief introduction from the author. I think this is the most terrifying idea I have ever had for a science fiction story. We've railed at the limitations of our senses as well as at the shortness of our lifespan. We have probed out into the infinity of space and dug up the relics of the past, trying to widen the bounds of our perception. We have found small comfort anywhere we looked. This story is about a man who transcended the last boundary and saw beyond the end of the universe. In a way, I suppose, it is reminiscent of that grim, pun intended, story of Grimm's the one about the man who invited his friend to peer into a microscope and to see there a fearful jungle of monsters tearing at one another, savaging and devouring their bodies in a frenzy of destruction. And when the friend demanded, aghast, Is this not hell? The man said, No, it is a drop of pond water. Round Trip To the most noble, most magnanimous, and most beautiful of evolved creatures, the Lady Le Real Bez Hamath, I, Derek Bez Hamath, send greetings, and these words by my own hand, Hail and farewell. Forgive me, wife, for addressing you as though you were a stranger, Forgive me for the agony which will come into your eyes when you take this letter from the hand of its bearer, who is, after all, myself, and know that I am indeed writing as the stranger which I have become. It is a long farewell which I must take of you, the longest that any man ever took of his beloved, and yet it is with the certainty that we shall meet again. Indeed, in a manner of speaking, when you read these very words we shall already have met again, in a manner of speaking. Where was the beginning? In what deity-forsaken pit of primeval time did I decree for myself this torment? And for you? But, oh, Lyriel, my darling, I sit here looking at your portrait, where it stands on the communicator, and know that I could call you and see your features move in reality, instead of in that eternal delightful smile which the artist prisoned in the cube yonder. But I dare not. I would rather remember you smiling, even if the memories of a poor shadow of your true self, than remember you as you would look were I to call and speak to you. Let me marshal my thoughts if I can. Let me recount the things you already know in order to prepare you for what you do not yet know and indeed for what I myself do not yet know, but am even so certain of beyond the chance of doubt. Do you remember our last days together, a planet, when we took the children to look at the cradle of our race? That was a lesson you had been saying for a long time we ought to teach them. I had held back, maintaining that their minds were too youthful and unformed for them to withstand the shock as yet. Eventually, you prevailed, though, I yielded for your sake, despite the shadow of melancholy it would cast over our parting. It must have been a beautiful world once, that planet where our stock sprang from. Even now it has its own sad loveliness, which I think I saw reflected in the children's eyes when at last they understood what had happened there. The pain and agony which the sight of that scarred earth still evokes in the human breast after how long? Do the archaeologists say? 11,000 years? 
And for every one of those years, 10,000 human beings, creatures at least a little like ourselves, died in lingering agony. It is a memory we like to hide from when we can. At our parting, I suspect that I was almost glad to flee from the image of that memory mirrored in your eyes and the children's. Yet it is always with us. Maybe it was the original root cause of our need to know, our need to comprehend the universe in which we find ourselves. But the day will come, sooner for you than for me, by a very long way, when mankind will have to find another motive for continuing to live, because it is within our grasp to know everything, literally and without qualification, everything about the cosmos. I took you and the children to Oyelet before I left to see the computers there, and I remember your little shiver when you first really felt in your bones that here was the analog of the universe. It is a gigantic concept, isn't it? The peak and perfection of nearly two millennia of concentrated effort have fruited on Oyelet. In the beginning, they were satisfied to cope with every particle of matter in our own galaxy, tracing back its history to the moment of the ultimate origin. But before they reached that point, they had to start taking into account the other galaxies and decided there was nothing for it but to build an analog for the cosmos entire. The observation, the lifetime-long excursions into the uttermost corners of the universe at speeds so great that we overtook time itself and could look from a distance at our own galaxy in its youthful prime. And the analysis of the results, it staggers the mind. And consequently, we know the answer to a problem which has baffled the best intelligences since before the dawn of history. At many stages of our growing knowledge, it seemed that the problem was itself meaningless, although it is recorded of the prehistoric sage Newton that he suspected the point of absolute relative non-motion might be found among the stars, which at that time people had no means of visiting. But the computers at Oyelet gave us the answer and located for us the point at which there is an equal amount of matter plus velocity, of energy in effect, in every conceivable direction. Insofar as the term has any meaning at all, one might say that here is the point at which it all began. You, me, the planet Earth, Oyelet, Sirius, and the other galaxies. This point, this theoretical location in space, is on the empty world line once occupied by the primal Elem. Here, within a few thousand miles of where I am writing to you, if it wasn't so important to us as human beings to know beyond a shadow of doubt, to verify with our direct perceptions what is predicted by our tools, the computers, we would never have troubled to come here. But we did, expecting, I may say, to find exactly what we had been told we would find. Nothing. I remember so clearly that it almost blinds me to the page on which I'm setting these inadequate words down, how we assembled in the observation room to, well, to look at that nothing we expected to find. Illogical, but we as a species have never been noteworthy for our logical behavior. As you well know, there are six ships in the expedition, identified to one another by hyperspatial links, and aboard them I have about 14,000 picked men and women, experts to the last. I have never been director of an expedition that so satisfied me, that so impressed me with the unison wave of enthusiasm which boiled up during the course of the uneventful journey. Somewhere deep in our minds it must have sprung from a sense of triumph, from the feeling that we puny material creatures, for all our mistakes, had unfailingly pursued our quarry to its lair. The fons et origo of the very matter in which we consist. I remember saying to Incoratuatar, my assistant, whom you haven't met, but who will doubtless visit you after this trip, 
that if our predictions were verified, we should have a deal of trouble gathering more data after this in order to base yet other predictions. He laughed as if the idea was new to him, and then he frowned, and off he went quietly by himself to return in a few hours' time with a plan for testing the predictions resulting from running the oil-lit computers in reverse. You will at once see what he was getting at. We had traced back the motion of every particle in the universe, in the planum, to its common point of origin. Conversely, we could extrapolate from these observed motions, we had all the necessary information by now, in order to find out what will be the end. In my spare time, said Inkorachuatar, and this, I may say, amused me, for he is the most dedicated man I've ever met, having neither family nor recreations, which was why they passed him over and selected me to be director of the expedition, despite my actually inferior record of achievement in purely scientific fields. In my spare time, and he blinked as if aware of my amusement, I have worked out two possible ends for the universe, one cannot grasp sufficient factors to decide between them. Possibly the recession from the point of ultimate origin will continue until energy is so diluted in space and time that every particle is contained in a universe of its own, having receded from every other particle to the point at which none can influence any others. And this, although indicated by some trends, seems unlikely unless some agency other than simple recession diminishes available gravitational force past the point at which any agglomeration of matter like a star or a planet can exist, or the universe may be a closed continuum, so that after a very long time indeed it turns a corner, to use the obvious metaphor, and the recession without changing its direction becomes an approach and brings all matter and energy back to its point of origin, time and space would close in with them. At the last, there would again be Elem, surrounded by emptiness so complete that it would possess not even the quality of existence. Into the silence in which we were contemplating the nature of such emptiness broke a voice, that of our chief pilot, he spoke in the deliberately controlled tones in which men always announce momentous news, such as that of a death or disaster. You must remember that we were closing in on the point at which we expected to find nothing. We were waiting for the sensitive instruments which indicated the relative amounts of energy existing in all directions from us to quiver into the absolute dead center of their mountings. And it was at this moment that Chief Pilot Koptet said, Director, there is a spaceship ahead of us. Naturally, we were stunned. Koptet informed me afterwards that he had been observing it for some seconds before he concluded that the thing ahead could only be a spaceship, owing to the fact that it was obviously artificial, perfectly spherical, and incredibly highly reflective. And a ship it was. We closed to within 200 miles of it, puzzling, and sent our six ships into orbit about it as if it had been a planet, for it was gigantic. I had imagined our own ships to be large, with their crews of more than 2,000 apiece, but this dwarfed them to dust grains. It was, well, it was like a marker. It was balanced precisely at the center of the universe. It had exactly the same amount of matter and energy on every side of it. Someone, I thought to myself, had known we were coming. I didn't utter the words to Inkorachuotar. He was thunderstruck as he contemplated the... the... Uh, object. And it was only after a half hour of silent amazement, shared by everyone in the expedition, I believe, that he turned to me and spoke in a shaky voice, Director, I had been envisaging just such a means of verifying our further predictions. 
I told him to make himself clearer while we waited to see if the spaceship would react to the arrival of strangers. He stumbled and was confused, but the gist of what he was saying was this, that given the time and the effort and the desire to know, all of which we human beings have in abundance, it would be possible to design and build a spaceship, only not just a spaceship, a device that would withstand billions upon billions of years of waiting, so that if the universe was cyclical, if one infinitely distant day the stars crashed together again, it would survive to tell the next visitors, to tell us. If Inkoratuatar's inspired guess was correct, this spaceship around which we orbited was exactly as old as the universe itself. It had been placed here, last time around, to await the arrival of someone else who wanted to know about the fate in store. Or it might have been placed here more recently, during this universal cycle, by another race with the same curiosity as mankind. There was only one way to find out. I called for space garb and a gravis sled, and we went to look. One would have thought that so gigantic an object would have had an appreciable gravitational field. It didn't, and on thinking it over, one saw that was logical. It must not react with or influence its surroundings in any way. But in that case, what was the good of it? Perfectly reflective, it hung awaiting our approach until we could see ourselves clinging to the gravis sled in the slightly deformed image thrown back by the curved skin. And then, as though a switch had been tripped, the hull turned black. I thought for an extraordinary moment it had vanished. Then I saw its bulk outlined against galaxies a trillion light-years distant, and Gestalt put it back in the place from which it had seemed to disappear. Cautiously unsure of what next to do, we circled it and saw that there were features on its surface. There was an opening. We headed towards it, flashing lamps into the yawning hole, and found that there was now a fair gravitational tug to contend with. It drew us gently down, and we found we could walk upright. I reflected that this substance on which I stood, whatever its nature might be, had perhaps survived the ultimate origin, which we now suspected was not, after all, the beginning of things, and looked into the heart of the ship and saw though at first I didn't recognize it, for my mind was geared to anticipate something wholly alien and strange, a word written up in our own language. Welcome. Oh, now we have fought down our disbelief, and now we can think and reason with the knowledge which the discovery has brought. But it took us days to convince ourselves even after we had searched through layer after layer of the ship's interior, finding renewed evidence at every turn. You will wish to know specifically what we found. We found pictorial records, film exposed through gigantic telescopes at 12 points on the sphere at a rate of about one frame every thousand years. I've seen that film. It's fantastic, magnificent, unbelievable. The film fits our projectors. We found magnetic recordings and instrument readings for every conceivable wave band of energy from cosmic radiation to gravity, and we simply dropped the tapes into our players. The most incredible of all are the tapes which record the ultimate origin. There, you see, I can't even yet free myself of the old habit pattern of thinking that the universe has only happened once. To be brief, we know, even without conducting in Korachuatar's program of research, that we have been here before. Perhaps only once, although I think more likely many millions of times. It doesn't matter. Let me get to the most important point of all. Concentric with the entire ship, at its heart, we found another featureless sphere, about 900 meters in diameter. We can't penetrate the exterior of it, 
small wonder, for it possesses the same properties which enabled the entire ship to withstand the pressures of the... of the origin and... end. You see, towards the end of the cycle, the defenses of the ship go up automatically, and thereafter the only record is the internal one of the energy required to resist what happens. As the energy has been storing up continually since the ship was first built, there is plenty available. Stolen from the universe, you may say, and this has interesting consequences. Why can't I keep my thoughts straight? I've missed out one very important thing. When we entered the ship the first time, underneath the message of welcome, we found a warning which said, among other things, that the defenses of the ship would remain down for as long as it took a certain dial to complete one revolution. We calculated that the time allowed was a very familiar unit, the year of a certain now devastated planet in an insignificant system well out towards the edge of our home galaxy. The year is up today. I ordered my crews to make the best possible use of the time given. We ripped out all the old records and replaced them with fresh stock for the benefit of the next visitors. We feel quite certain that no one else in this universal cycle will interfere with this ship. After all, we built it. We built it. Let me spell that out. In the very first cycle of the universe, men were undecided as to whether there was a cycle. So they built this spaceship using energy and matter stolen from the universe, which would never, except during this one year out of every universal cycle, influence the rest of the cosmos again. Only... I've been calculating, and I find there was a first cycle which never should have been repeated. Mathematically, I can express this tidily. In words, the energy and matter of the cosmos bounced off that ship, and because it was so perfectly reflective, the first cycle did repeat almost exactly, but for one small qualification. There was diminution in the total amount of energy, a tiny quantity, but not negligible, was locked forever and ever in the spaceship. So it's our doing that the universe is cyclic. There was a first time which, but for our intervention, would have been unique. Since, there have been repetitions which will continue until the resonating together of many minute discrepancies causes someone, myself presumably, or the echo of myself, to plant a hydrogen bomb inside the ship instead of refilling the recording devices. You see, a cumulative difference is building up from universe to universe, partly due to the knowledge that the universe is cyclical. Ah, uh, how clumsy and fumbling words are compared to the clarity and simplicity of math. Chiefly, this is due to the first builders having worked so well, none of their successors needed to make ships of their own and duplicate the task. Also, there is the sphere within the sphere I mentioned above. Just lately, over the past few weeks, it became to me a matter of desperate importance to know what was in there. I left my routine work to Inkoratuatar and spent my time prowling about, inspecting, investigating, wondering, until I came to the conclusion that I already knew why that sphere was there, that it would open to allow access to the interior, then close again, and that the time of opening would most likely be when the dial marking our allowance of time reached the last segment of its year-long sweep. I've already mentioned our illogical reason for coming here, when, if we relied on the prediction of the oilet computers, we would expect to find nothing. We came because we wanted to verify with our own senses that nothingness which our tools foretold. This spaceship, which has seen the universe grow old and grow young again, is also a tool, and human beings built it. There would have been an urge to verify its data, too. This is what makes me believe beyond any chance of scientific proof, that the universal cycle we are in is not the second or the thousandth, 
but probably something of the order of the 10 to the 10th. You see, the first Derek Bez Hamath, the first myself, could not have been married. He could not have faced going into the dark unknown if he had left behind someone like you, my darling, or two beautiful children like ours. And yet, and yet, this must be a small terror. From the last universe to this one, the effect of the theft of energy has been so tiny that not even the language has changed. So, I shall do what I have to do. When the creeping dial in the ship has only a few hours of its course to complete, I shall go back. No one will be permitted to accompany me. I shall leave this letter propped up against your portrait. I shall look at the picture one final time and go to find the defenses of the inner sphere down. And inside that sphere? <laughs> Why, myself. So after more billions of years than one can imagine, my predecessor will come out and take my place as I am taking his, and he will bring you this letter. You will find him a very little different from me. He will look at you across a gulf of inconceivable ages, but that is all. I hope, my darling, that the little difference will not be enough to cause you suffering. And I, in a few hours from now, or so it will appear to me, I shall come forth again and know I am looking on a new universe, and I shall find just such a letter as this, and take it to someone who will not be you precisely, but very much like you. And as she reads it, I shall think of you. But after that, I shall try to forget that we are in a different cosmos. I shall try to forget myself and become the man who will have released me. So, I hope, will the man I go this moment to release become your adoring husband, Darak Bez Hamat.